Have you ever wanted to know exactly what each switch in your favorite spacecraft actually does? Well, today we're talking to Ed Rafis, who is attempting to learn exactly that. And not only learn, but to teach us as well, as he has set up a fantastic website, spacecraftguide.com, where you can find out how any component works with just one click. We love to hear your opinions on what we're doing. Let us know via our social media pages at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram, Threads, and Facebook, or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, enjoy episode 152 of the Space and Things podcast. Oh my God. listening to the Space and Things Podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. And welcome to episode 152 of our podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We're having a little summer storm during the recording of this podcast, so... (laughs) I'm a little anxious because I'm like, God, please don't let it kick me off the Zoom or anything like that. But other than that, I'm doing great. Uh, Things are going well here. So excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So a little update. Emily and I had a had a email exchange this week where I just wanted to put forward my plans for the for the future of the podcast. I would love this podcast to go on forever. I, I absolutely love doing it. But I have to start being a, Me too. a little bit realistic about how much time I spend on it versus how I need to make a living. <laughs> so yes. I said to Emily that I think what we should do is commit to doing 200 episodes which would be amazing, and then see where we're at in terms of finances. So I have set a goal, which is if we can get to 100 Patreon subscribers by episode 200, we would definitely keep going. That may change and other financial sources may come up into play between now and then. That's a lot of time, 48 weeks between now and then. But we're currently on 53. So if anyone is sitting on the fence about deciding whether to come and join us over on Patreon, now might be a good time. Well, you've got 48 weeks, really. But if you could uh, perhaps come and join us, it would be really great. Uh, and, and if we want this to carry on, we'll know we're doing the right thing. If we hit that milestone, I think that's a after it will be nearly four years at that point. I think that will make us know, yes, we're doing the right thing. So just wanted to update you, our listeners, that that's what we're we're planning on doing but you definitely got at least until show well episode 200 so another 47 of these at least and there's so much we can cover in that amount of time right yeah there is absolutely there is a lot we can cover in that amount of time yeah like they said i just want to reiterate you know if you'd like to sign up for our patreon we'd love to get up to 100 people on our Patreon, uh, we'd love to go beyond 200 episodes. I know I would. Yeah, me too. This whole uh, podcast experience for me has been really awesome. Uh, and it's been really cool to to have a awesome co-host and uh, to meet so many people through this experience as well. So, and I'd, I'd like to keep it going. So yeah, if you can, uh, you know, sign up for our Patreon or anything like that, uh, we, we'd love to have you. We really would. On to this week's main feature. So as Emily said, one of the great things about doing this podcast is that we've met so many amazing people, mostly online, but I'm still hopeful that I'll be able to meet as many of our listeners in person at some point as well. Anyway, one of the people who's been in so incredibly supportive of us is Ed Rafus. Now, he's been a Patreon supporter for nearly two years now and is always offering us interesting questions for our guests. Uh, He's a pilot for a major airline and has over 20,000 hours of flight and 30 years of experience. But he turned his attention to helping us all understand how our favorite spacecraft work by setting up an interactive website called spacecraftguide.com. So far on the website, there are guides for the Space Shuttle, Gemini and Apollo spacecraft and the International Space Station. He's also set up a virtual reality museum where he can float around the various spacecraft as well. Uh, These resources are fantastic for us enthusiasts, but also are an incredible educational tool. So this week we thought we'd ask him to tell us all about it. Houston, this is Space and Things Base here. It's time to crack on. So, Ed, thank you so much for joining us this week. As I'm sure you're aware, this is what we ask every guest on Space and Things. So what started your interest in spaceflight? Did it arise due to your piloting career and you know, just tell us a little bit about your background. First of all, thank you for having me on Space and Things. I am a big fan. 
I started into, I think it was one of the first, maybe the first issue. So, but what got me into space, I actually am one of those people that can remember the exact moment that I was interested in the space program. I was in school going to research, uh, recess. It was, um, in the winter, it was in December. So I was walking out, going to my cubby to put my, my jacket and my boots on to go outside and play in the snow. And my cubby was right next door to the next classroom and they had a TV in there. And I'm, I'm going to have to say my age here and, um, uh, it was a color TV. So this was pretty big that, that they had in there. And on the TV, I saw Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt walking on the moon. It was Apollo 17 and I was mesmerized. I, you know, and I put on my jacket as slow as I could. And then after I did that, then I, you know, I hesitated and then I was looking and then I just stood there. Then the bell rang and I was the last person to go back into the classroom. And from then, you know, I was drinking Tang and eating the space <laughs> food sticks. And I, you know, I had on the, when I had the Tang, they had the little uh, rover that went on the moon and I played with that with my friends at school. I mean, that, that was it. That's when I was, that's when I went in, I uh, really went into the space program. And did that inspire you to want to be a pilot? Yes, it did. Actually, a lot of people told me that I couldn't be a pilot because, you know, pilots have to be extremely smart and all this other, and astronauts too, what well, was beyond that. And I actually started in engineering. Um, I was in aerospace engineering and I was bored. Uh, but while I was doing that, I start, started taking up flying lessons. I started flying out of Midway Airport. Uh, it was close to the school that I went to, college that I went to. And then I just said, you know what? I'm not happy with this. And I went to flight school. And there I actually met uh, Bob Cabana. Oh, wow. He was recruiting for NASA. As like now, I want to fly, you know, because they had they had the uh, the Concord, and mm. I thought we're going to go faster, we're going to go higher, and so I I stuck with aviation instead of going to NASA. So, how did you go from being a pilot to putting together this museum and this online resource for spacecraft? All right, well, um, while I was a pilot, I was an accident and incident investigator. I'd look at all these things and I noticed that the, the biggest problem was the, the pilots didn't have enough information to get them out of the problem. And in 1997, the internet hit. And when <laughs> yes. that happened, it's like, oh my goodness, this is perfect. We can get the information quickly to the pilots. So I started an electric manual and I did it on the 737 and tested it with pilots. And I was just way too far ahead of my time. <laughs> and so I started really slow and I started with the shuttle. I started with images and then I started doing posters, interactive posters. You can see behind me here. And I documented all the lights, buttons, swishes in the command module and the lunar module for Apollo. And I was just testing it out to see everything that I had with the pilots because I couldn't get them to do it to see if it would work for the public. And I was working on that in January of 2020. And then the uh, Smithsonian releases those panoramas of the inside of Apollo. And I jumped on them when I could. And they were saying, okay, let's see what you can do with them. So then I started uh, documenting each light button and switch. It started with the Apollo command module. And then COVID hit. Um, everybody was home from work and home from school and our local library, they had, oh, uh, these interactive tours, virtual reality tours of museums and they were art museums. Nice. So I'm like, okay, maybe I'll change the name to an interactive virtual reality museum and tested that. And we tested it with the kids and it was a, a free for a year with through all of COVID to get through that. And then when that was done, then the library, they had what they called a library of things. So they had the Oculus set. So then I found the software to turn that into um, not only interactive on your smart device, but also an Oculus. Nice. And they really, really liked that. So then they supported me, helped me get the software. And then uh, from that, then I started 
the museum, the Interactive Virtual Reality Museum, uh, just to spread this out. And I got a lot of, I got some followers, um, not as much as you, but I got some followers on Patreon. And they also gave me input. They said, okay, we, we like what you're doing. Can you give video descriptions? So now I have a YouTube channel and I'm almost, I have 560 followers on that. I explain every light button and switch once a week. As a matter of fact, it just came out, uh, what is it, three hours ago. And from that, I'm putting everything together to make it easier. And the whole idea really about this project is to make the information, the documents from NASA more accessible. And instead, a lot of people, what they do is they copy it, they put it in the PDF, they slap it up as a manual. It's like, oh, wow. What I'm trying to do is make it so one click or one step, get to any piece of information on any component on well, any spacecraft. And they, then people can get their information from it and, and build enthusiasm on it. So that, that's how the whole thing uh, created in a nutshell. Last week, we had a Gemini, Gemini, Gemini <laughs> uh, expert on the yes. show, which sets the scene. I think Dave's probably laughing, <laughs> which sets the scene for you being on this week's show as you des uh, devised, I'm sorry, interactive schematics for Gemini, Apollo, mm -hmm. Space Shuttle, et cetera, beyond. Yeah. Uh, you've talked a little bit about it. So what was the process for getting a hold of some of the schematics and, and making them you know, available to everybody and interactive. First, it started with the Google search. I started with Gemini for the 50th anniversary of that. And I was on another Facebook uh, post and I was trying to figure out how everything worked with Gemini. And I am I had the information for Gemini 11 and I'm saying, wait, that doesn't match up with the, the images that I have. And I kept talking, you know, to these people. It's like, why, why isn't this going together? And then they got really angry at me and said, you don't know what's going on. That's a Gemini 6. I'm like, oh, I did not know that. Okay. So then um, it's like, okay, we'll come back. And then I went, I went to the Space Hipsters and I started asking those questions. And that's where I got the documentation. Oh, and wow. the other one too is your, the last guest you had, I actually listened to him the first time that he did your podcast and I got information from him too. So it's been finding the experts and the space hipsters, you guys, you guys have the experts. So it's just from this that I've been able to get that information and then turn that into uh, some way that you can easily search and find the information. So some schematics are really quite extensive, uh, particularly the shuttle switches. Uh, I've looked at the shuttle one and... Personally, I have no idea how somebody like Vance Brand could memorize all that stuff or at least, you know, at least be familiar with it. So how long did it take you to put that particular schematic together? Well, actually, um, it's not putting the, the uh, schematics together. It's trying to explain them. And I took the I'm taking the original documents. I'm not changing them. And then I look at them and I look at them for a long time. <laughs> I try to find. OK. Now there's, this is a diode here. How does that affect with this? Oh, this is a relay. You know, and, and I just try to get it all together. It's quite difficult. It takes me a while to go. And I'm not going to say that they're perfect. And right. I rely on other people that um, are on my YouTube channel. They're, you know, they're, there's a lot of people on the YouTube channel that are really bright. And also the Patreon uh, subscribers to say, this isn't correct. And for a long time, I like, okay, something simple like gimbal. All right. The gimbal, then you say like there's three arms to the gimbal. It's like, no, it's two arms and a base. <laughs> so when they were talking, they were describing it with two and someone said, no, 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 no. There's three axes. So there has to be three gimbals. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's really difficult to go over it. But then I, like I say, I have the experts and then I can't, if I'm really confused, I just text them or uh, DM them or reach out to them directly in Facebook. And then, then I find somebody else who's like, oh yeah, I worked on that system. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Okay. That's like, I know I'm, I'm definitely friending you and bookmarking, you know, everything you say. The schematics are, are really, really difficult, but they are very in depth in the shuttle and going back. 
I'm working on the International Space Station now and trying to find that information is extremely difficult and the schematics are extremely simple. So there, there's more to it and that I'm always looking for really the deep part of it, of how it works. Yeah, I guess one of the big challenges as well is trying to explain it to people of all levels of knowledge and coming in it from, you know, explaining it to someone maybe who's five, six, seven years old, right up into someone who also yeah. built the thing uh, and make it so that both of those sets of people get some enjoyment out of what you've created and educational aspect from from what you've created, correct? Correct. And, and I'm glad you said that because that's exactly what I'm going to trying to do. It's the person who's an enthusiast uh, just to get their enthusiasm up to the next level without knocking them down. But that, you know, with also the rocket scientists, which is like, oh, that's where that piece of information is where it saves them time when they're looking or doing research on that. But yeah, that that's yeah, you hit the nail on the head. And um I am also a my 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 kids are in scouts. I'm a leader and I do the space exploration merit badge. And we have it starts at sixth grade going to tenth trying, you know, and then trying to explain to them, um, well, you know, the first question is how do you pee in space? You know? Yeah. And it's like, well, I'm not only going to show you how that happens, but how we turn that into your soup for the next day. And then I got them <laughs> and, you know, and then, then we have to, it's like, okay, got the excitement going. This is the diagram of how it happens. And then I introduced them to the schematics so then they can visualize exactly what's happening. But it, it is a very big challenge to get that wide range. And um, I'm, hopefully I'm, I'm getting close to making it easy for everybody. All right. So you've talked a little bit about this because you just discussed the, the scouts, which is really awesome. Uh, and I love the idea that they have a merit badge for space exploration. That's really cool. So this resource is, is helpful not only to adults wondering where a specific switch or a component is, but it's also a really uh, great educational tool. So do you share it with students as an educational resource? What kind of students and how many do you share it with? Well, I just got back from camp last week and I was testing it. The problem we have at camp is the internet is like non-existent. So I had to make the app for it and I'm sharing it with all the scouts in our council. There's 12,000, but I give it out to everybody 12, uh, with the lesson plan. It's the basics. You're not going to go really deep into each component, but you're going to go into the system and that's the major. And then if I can get them, you know, get people hooked there, then if they want to, they can become a Patreon uh, subscriber. But right now the basics, um, uh, I get that out through the internet and give it out to as many people as I can to other, a lot of other educators. And then I get a lot of input on how they like it and how to make it better too. So mm -hmm. it, it's sort of helping me make the, the product better. So have you collaborated with any museums or like traveling exhibits or anything like that? Um, I have collaborated with the CERN Earth and Space Center. Uh, Chris McCall runs that program and it's, it's a really small museum, but they have some really interesting fact, uh, uh, artifacts there. And one is like the IMU of... of from one of the Apollo spacecraft, I'm not sure. And um, they have Gene Cernan's spacesuit that he wore on Apollo 10, things like that. So I, I com collaborated first with them uh, to put QR codes next to it. So then a visitor can go there, click on the IMU and they can see about it. And then I also have a video description so then they can listen to it and learn about it. So all of those reference documents are right there for anyone who goes to the museum. I approached Chris uh, for the 50th anniversary of the last man to make footprints on the moon, as they called it. And then the latest thing, and they were the first museum that I did a panorama with just to see if it would work. And it turned out really well. I learned it, it, it's not perfect, but you can see where the parts are it'll give you an idea when you go to the museum what you can see. Explain how that works. So that's a that's a panoramic photo of the museum that people online can then go and explore the museum online? Yes. Yeah, um, and the, the, the idea is um, people can go there on the internet to, you know, if they're not able to get to the museum, like you right. know, they could be in another country, 
or if they're local and they're trying to figure, you know, and they're like, oh, what does this have? And then they can look in there and then generate the interest. I don't give them all of it. They have to go there to, to scan nice. the, the QR codes and stuff like that to make it, you know, to make them come out there. And, but just to show interest so we can support those kind of museums. And then I worked with, uh, with Space Hipsters, the field trip that you went to the New Mexico Space uh, History Museum. And I worked with them to make a sort of a, a pseudo tour book uh, so they could have something of a, like a, a QR code, but I haven't done, I haven't done the virtual reality there. We'll have to see. I'm still talking to them about it. We're going to see how that works. Recently, you went to Kennedy Space Center for an event for educators. Yes. So tell us about this experience and has it made you change anything about what you're trying to achieve? Well, it's not helping me change what I do, but it's shown me a lot more resources that I have. Well, I went to the Center for Space Education, right. and it helped that I am a, a space station ambassador, which is part of the ISS National Laboratory. And from that, I got an invitation for educators to go there. And basically, you go to, you go to learn about the tools for education and see what other NASA tools that they have. And it was incredible. It was overwhelming. Um, we, we basically had kind of the run of the place. Well, we had classes on technology like augmented reality. So I'm doing virtual reality. I'm looking at augmented reality. And they had people from the National Buoyancy Lab there showing us wow. the tools that they're using with the astronauts. And it's like, wow, okay, that's great. Yeah, so we made those contacts. Cool. Then they had the tours and the tours were incredible. It's like, uh, I, I've been on the tours there before and we had a tour to pad 39B, which was for Apollo 10. And they, they also did a lot of the shuttle launches and then they did Artemis, Artemis 1. And so we took the tour and they took us up, you know, they took us up and I've been to the pad, but then we got out of the bus and they had all these pieces of metal out. And it's like, those were the, the blast shields from, in, uh, from the, from the blast trough to, to push the rust away. Wow. And they're saying, yeah, that's, that's, that's where it came from. And some of these plates were bad because the Artemis was so powerful. It melted stuff. Wow. And, you know, because the Saturn, that the Saturn they took off, that was 7 million pounds. They went up to 8 million pounds to get Artemis off the launch pad. So, and they were, they were explained, we had a person who was in charge of the pan explain stuff like that to us. And then they took us around, um, in the bus and we went up to where the crawler came onto the pad and the, the person there was explaining to us, um, you know, that's the pad and, and those are the points. And he says, okay, we're going to have 15 minutes here. You can go around and look. Wow. Um, it was like, okay. So everybody, everybody like gets out. We go around and I, I'm just taking video of where the escape, you know, where the escape thing is. And it goes down into the, oh, the, where they catch the, the baskets. And then we started walking closer and closer to the center where the, the rocket blast happens. And we kept walking. It's just like, they just said, be nice, be courteous. If we tell you not to go any farther, don't go any further. So I see the other people, they're walking and walking closer and they're not getting yelled at. So I keep walking and we went to the exact center uh, where the thrust deviator was. All the plates are gone. So we get to see inside and I've never, and it's like, I'm right there over the top looking at it. And he goes, okay, that's enough. That's enough. Now, you know, come on back. And then I saw someone else from, um, he runs a school up in Tallahassee, um, a magnet school. And he comes running up behind me to take a quick picture of it before you get, and we were, we were having a great time. And then I got a panorama of that, of the pad. I didn't oh, get nice. all the way up to lunch, but I got, so I can explain, you know, a lot of the points that that's coming soon. So we had that. And then, we, then we went to the crawler and it was funny is Isabel Kennedy was the person that was running uh, the, the center. Uh, well, for 2000 space expo is what they called it. And she's on the bus. She says, okay, whatever you do, don't touch the crawler. It's like, all right. So we go up and we get to the crawler and we meet with the person who's in charge of the crawler. This is the guy who runs the whole thing. And he asks any questions. First question that came out from another teacher was, 
they said we can't touch the crawler. Why can't we touch the crawler? And he looked and says, you can touch the crawler all you want. I don't care. It's just don't get the bus dirty. You know, and it's like, okay, all right. So everybody had to have their hand on the crawler and take their picture. We had one person that they said, oh, it would be cool if we had a photo of like the crawler is running over me. So they're laying in front of the crawler. And it's, it was hysterical. It was so much fun. So we did that. And then we also, I got to meet uh, Dr. Uh, Leo Proctor, which was Sorry, really Proctor. cool. Nice. Talk about inspirational. And then also Charlie Blackwell Thompson, oh, who nice. was the launch director for Artemis. And it was great. It was really inspirational. It talks about how, you know, how you ask me, how did I get interested in space? She actually explained who it was. She knew who it was. Wow. That talked to her, to get her to where she was. And um, yeah, so if, if, you, if there's any educators out there, please look into the, uh, the Center for Space Education. You can go there and then they have like, um, if you're a teacher, they can, uh, if you go to the center, you can actually go uh, into the area and they have like a, a, for an hour, they'll give you projects and things to do with your students. So it's a great, great program. And I got, I have a lot of good um, panoramas there. I have the one of the shuttle. And then I also have one of the Rocket Guard. And nice. I'm hopefully going to be working with other people from this podcast to enhance oh, nice. what I'm doing with, with what the panoramas are. Finally, what is your vision in the future for your guides? Okay, well, the vision, and, and this is way out there, is, um, uh, you know, Jarvis from Iron Man? Yes. You know how <laughs> you can say something and it brings up the information? <laughs> That's the goal. The goal is to make it so easy that someone can ask about it and then they can get the information they want. And instead so Jarvis stands for just another really very intelligent system. I'm calling it very intelligent computer knowledge base interface. And <laughs> nice. that's Vicky. Vicky. Yes. So that that's where I'm going for. And that's actually that that's my wife's name too. Aww. She's been supporting me doing this and it takes, it takes a lot of time. So it's it, the least I can do for her, but that's where we're going. And, um, what I'm doing now is I'm using the panoramas. I'm actually able to make my own panoramas. I still have to get some like the international space station. I have that. And then I also get the inside of the Artemis. I'm getting that from NASA oh, and wow. I'm doing the same thing, putting information on it. But what I'm doing to enhance it is going to the, the source people who actually did this. Like you, you had Fred Hayes and I have the shuttle that was at Kennedy Space Center. I'm, I'm going to take snippets of that and put that into the Spacecraft Interactive Virtual Reality Museum. So you can have not only the person who did it, but then the person who tested it. Amazing. I mean, that, that's like, that's mind blowing that you guys got that. And I thank you for letting me have that. And when I get that all together, I wanted to, uh, we will hopefully we'll put that out that if, if you're a Patreon person on my site or a Patreon on space and things, you'll be able to get this information and then it'll have links back to you so you can see the, or hear the full interview. And like I said, I'm contacting people that are on your podcast, um, and it's just, it's basically, we've got a great, huge community here. And it's just using those people to make things that create enthusiasm for space. Because right now there is a big push for going to back to the moon. And it's sort of like, it's that sweet spot that we had with Apollo. And I don't want to lose that opportunity. And the great thing is everybody seems, there, there's, there's certain communities that get all these people together. And you're one of them. And that's what I want to enhance so we can, we can keep going. You know, it's just like, we're going to moon to stay. It's like, really? Okay, let's make sure. And let's get the uh, enthusiasm for, from the public this time. Because I actually, I lived through Skylab. I remember I had an uncle and he saw the cost of what it took to get things in, in the Skylab. And, and he's like, man, maybe they should just give them a table and they should stay up there for a while because they're costing <laughs> so much money. That was kind of the attitude that we had back then with Skylab. And I'm like, we're going to space. We're staying in space for a month or so. And I want to make sure that we don't lose it. And that's, that's what I'm hoping 
to create with the Spacecraft Interactive Virtual Reality Museum. Ed, I, I just want to let you know, I yes. was hoping that I was going to get through the whole of this episode with no Skylab mentions because it's the 50th anniversary <laughs> of uh, the launch of that second you crew were, mission. I I, that. No, 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 no. No, I love the fact that it's happened. It's the, even when we try not to mention Skylab, yes. it still it still finds its way in. It still finds its way in. Well, at least I didn't mention Boran. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm, exp- I'm waiting for the panorama of oh, Boran, man. that's for sure. That's, that's, that's one I want to well, see. <laughs> I I don't fly to Moscow anymore, but um, yeah, when we, the, 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 I'm actually the last pilot to land the, uh, oh, an wow. American airplane in Moscow, American commercial airplane in Moscow. Wow. So and we, I used to go to the museum there all the time, all the time, and I have video of it. Yeah. Do they not have one in Germany? I'm sure there's a Boran in Germany You're somewhere. right. They do. Yeah, that's a Spire. Yes. yes, I've no idea if they've got any of the cockpit. In I there, do have. I have video. I have video of the cockpit because oh, you could actually walk in. It was one of the test models. It it, it was in their oh their fairground that they nice. had like the world's fair, and they had one in there. You could walk through it. Thank you so much for joining us. Ed. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate. I it. absolutely love what you're doing. It's really great. So please keep it up. Uh, okay, and, uh, and 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 keep send, sending us stuff that you're up to, and and we'll make sure we're sharing them out with our listeners and uh, and putting it on our social medias and stuff like that because it's really really cool what you're doing, and yeah, looking forward Thank to. Yeah, I love that idea that you're you're using some of the interviews that we've done and putting them within the exhibit as well. That's so cool. That's cool. It, it brings everything together, doesn't it? I think that's what this this yes. is. You you mentioned the word community a few times, and that's my big takeaway from from what we've done. This whole interview is yes. all you are so community yes. focused, even though we're trying to learn about a specific spacecraft you're doing it through community and for community and i think that's a yeah a wonderful thing you're trying to do yeah so i can nerd out with yeah with uh, with, with people f- yeah you know? exactly and isn't it wonderful when you can do that it's just such a wonderful yes. thing to be able to do and my family knows it's like okay he's going he's to a do funny that. thing <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, <laughs> right uh thank you so much for joining us ed this really has thank you. been wonderful celebrating the 50th anniversary of skylab this is Space and Things. Now, I know I just said this in at the end of that interview, but I do love how this is such a big community project. Obviously, it's been led by Ed, but he leans into the community so much and he's he didn't doesn't seem to have an ego about it. It's it's very much a open platform where people can make their suggestions and tell him tell him if he's right or wrong and he doesn't get offended by that kind of stuff. He wants to try and make these as best as he can and he knows the way of doing that is by doing this community-led project where you can put it out there for tenure, or, or, I guess, right? It's like, it's like when, you, when you're when yeah. you a PhD student and you write a paper and you put it out there and, and you, you ask the scientific community to come back and say, you've not thought about this or this is good or have you questioned this or this, that, and the other. And I like that aspect of it. I think it's really good. Not only that, it's an amazing resource that he's done. Like... I love looking at the command switches of of the spacecraft when I go to museums. I love seeing those, just seeing the display panels and being like, whoa, how did you know everything, what it is and this, that and the other. And sometimes you're watching a movie or something like that and someone flicks a switch and you don't know what it does. If perhaps if you're watching Apollo 13 and you hear someone say, oh, flick that switch and you've got no idea because they don't explain anything there, but they kind of don't need to. It's not really essential. But maybe you do have an interest and you can just go on the Apollo version of his thing, find that switch, click on it, and there's a description about what it does. And I love that. I think it's such a cool resource that this exists. And I'm surprised it's not been done before, but it's it's so cool. Yeah, as you just said, I love the idea that it's very community focused. Sometimes... When we talk about spacecraft, aircraft, whatever, I think people, you know, get very upset when you say this might not be exactly correct. Or, so I've seen it on space hipsters where somebody will post something and it, it might have a, you know, a mistake in it or something. And there's stuff you're just you're just not going to know everything about everything. I mean, even I'm sure the people who flown the program don't know exactly 100 percent everything about the spacecraft. They know a lot about it, but they don't know like every single itty bitty facet. So I like the idea that it's community based and and Ed's really not afraid to to sort of get constructive feedback. I think that's really cool to keep an open mind and to not 
to just be like, okay, you know, this is a community project and we're not going to tear each other down. Or to me, that's the spirit of what the, the, what I think the space community should be. You know, we should kind of, it should be collaborative. It shouldn't be yeah. one person, you know, thinking they're the, they're the bomb and they know everything. I love the idea that he's fostered something that's necessarily collaborative. I think that's really cool. So I love this project. I think it's really awesome. And I'm really glad he's on our show this week. I think this is really cool. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, it was a really nice interview as well. He's just a thoroughly nice guy, isn't he? Yeah, he's easy to talk to. I've been to that museum in uh, the, the the Sun and Space Museum, the tiny museum where he, that he talked about as well. It's a really cool museum. If you ever got a car and you're near sh- Chicago and you can drive outside of Chicago and find it. It's amazing. It's it's only one room, but they've got some amazing stuff in there. So it's definitely worth getting out out to if you can. Uh, and the fact that Ed has created these little QR codes that you can then zap and find out more about these artifacts. I mean, I just love that, that he's gone to a museum and said, hey, I can help you give even more information to people. I just think that's it. It's such a cool thing. So I'm interested to see where he takes this and, and how far he can get with it and how much he gets embraced by by people and in, in d- different people in different places. And I re- just want him to be so successful with this. I just want it to be a successful project because I can see how much passion he puts into it and, and how much he cares. And I think that, again, that enthusiasm is easy to get swept up in when someone is so excited about something. And all right, that will sell it to beyond space enthusiasts as well. That enthusiasm. Uh, the fact he's doing it with the scouts, amazing. Anyway, if you want to see the full unedited interview of that, you can watch it on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash space and things. And in the show notes, there'll be links to the website and all the things aired for you to uh, to check out if you haven't already. Uh, and of course, once it's ready, within our Patreon page and within uh, Ed's Patreon page as well will be this interactive space shuttle exhibit, which you'll get an idea of what he's up to. And I think that's amazing. Space and Things Podcast, launching from your favorite podcast platform every Thursday. Okay, Emily, what's caught your eye in space flight this week? On this show, we do like to talk about sort of unsung heroes in space flight, uh, maybe people you haven't heard of who contributed a lot to the space program. And this week, According to uh, Space.com, we are mourning the loss of yet another hidden figure, Evelyn Boyd Granville, who died earlier in July at age 99. According to her obit on Space.com, she contributed greatly. She went to Smith College uh, in her undergrad, and then she went to Yale and got her uh, doctorate in 1949. She started working at IBM in 1956 and then was contracted. I, that team was contracted by NASA in 1959, and she worked on programs such as the Project Vanguard satellite, the first crewed Mercury launches, and later the Apollo program, which is pretty amazing. And she fought also, you know, the sort of the racial discrimination that was going on at the time to accomplish all these things, which is was no easy feat. After she left NASA, she became a math professor at uh, California State University and wrote several mathematics textbooks, and she also taught at the University of Texas at Tyler. She uh, passed away at 99 earlier this month, which is also incredible. Not many people live to be 99. I've always loved the fact that we've sort of profiled lesser-known people in spaceflight I, I love astronauts. I don't want to make it sound like, I, you know, God, Emily hates astronauts all of a sudden, but we hear a lot about them and we don't hear enough about the people who are sort of in the background making things possible for astronauts. And a lot of the Apollo astronauts, they'll be the first to say, you know, we did this with the help of over 40,000 people. I mean, it wasn't just us. So I think it's awesome to give a shout out to people like Evelyn Boyd Granville, who just passed away at age 99. So also, I think this week, um, JWST celebrated uh, the one year, uh, first year doing scientific operations. And I want to say one of its most recent, uh, I, I may have already talked about this, one of its most recent discoveries, it released a uh, uh, series of uh, images from Saturn of its moons and of some of its rings and things like that. So um, JWST is like one year in to doing its uh it's all its amazing things and uh we're gonna have several decades more of awesome uh 
discoveries. I'm sure. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. As we know, a Hubble is still going strong and doing its thing and it's still doing, it's still making discoveries and th- over 30 years after it was launched, which is just amazing. So those are the things that caught my eye this week. So Dave, uh, what have you been looking at this week? It's funny. I also had Evelyn Boyd Granville written down. Uh, which, oh which, no! I'm sorry. No, no, no! Don't apologize. I think, I think that just it goes to show, doesn't it, that we're on the same page with these kind of things. That we do like. To, yeah, that's good to highlight the lesser known figures. Which, which I have a second one written down shortly after we we recorded last week. So unfortunately, I didn't get it into the episode. But shortly after we recorded last week in Space Hipsters, Bill Moore, the guy who co-authored the book with Fred Hayes. Uh, announced that Tom Weichel, who was one of the mission controllers from Apollo 7 through to Apollo 13, unfortunately passed away as well. Uh, he was a retro fire, one of the Oklahoma farm boys that ended up working in mission control after studying science and engineering at college. Uh, and he, he was in Gene Krantz's white team and was in mission control for the first moon landing. So one of the people that was there behind the scenes, right, right in the thick of it, um, and during the, the 54th anniversary of Apollo 11, unfortunately, he passed away. And I believe, did you did you meet him in Oklahoma? Were you at that Oklahoma field trip? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I remember he was really kind of humble, quiet, soft-spoken. A lot of those guys from that era were just very like, yeah, that was a job. You know, they, they're very, you know, sort of very humble about what they did. That is a also a big loss in the space community as well. And I just hate losing these guys, man. I just yeah. hate it. <laughs> I just exactly. hate it. I know exactly what you mean. It's 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 not fun, is it? And it seems to be all the time. Um, but yeah, I, his story. I like he he left he left NASA after Apollo thirteen because he wanted to raise his children on the same farm that he grew up in, and I love that. Yeah, I just love that. It's such a a, a, a wonderful little st- story to do with that. Anyway. Uh, that is sad news. Uh, potentially more sad news is the other space story that's really caught my eye. Is the, and we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago that the Mars sample return mission is way over budget and now looks like it might be in jeopardy altogether. There was a, a recent budget within the US Senate which talked about the NASA budget. And while they have approved the budget for Artemis for the next few years, they've cut the budget for planetary science by half a billion uh, which is a hell of a lot. And and the main part of that, which is being cut, looks like it's going to be this Mars sample return. Or they've said, if you want to fund that, NASA, then you have to find it in other parts of your... Which isn't ideal. And I appreciate that the costs may have gone up pretty much exponentially. And, and you know, it's one of those things, I'd like to think that we, we're going to get a Mars sample back on this planet in our in my lifetime. I mean, hopefully that... A human's gone and collected, but every time there seem we seem to get to the point where something might be happening with Mars, more hurdles are put in, or, or it seems to get more and more complicated. And I don't think we fully appreciate how, exactly how difficult the idea of getting anything to and from Mars actually is. Oh yeah, um, I mean, it hasn't happened yet, has it? Nothing's not. We've never had a returning spacecraft from Mars. I don't believe. No. To my knowledge, mainly all the Mars uh, analyses of soil have been done on the on the surface of it. Nothing has actually come back to our planet. And it is kind of a shame because it's like, yeah, it would be cool to have that, you know. And I just feel like it's almost sort of like we're in the 70s again. Almost because in the 70s, every a, a lot of NASA's budget was going to the space shuttle. That's just how it is. NASA didn't have much of a budget back then. Yeah. You know, and even within the shuttle program, there were a lot of cuts, you know, and it's, I feel like it's similar with Artemis, you know, Artemis, a lot of money is going to that program, obviously. And I'm sure even within the Artemis program, we're going to see a lot of cuts. We're probably not going to see stuff go as planned, unfortunately. And, and that causes a lot of missions on other, in other parts of, you know, NASA, such as, you know, planetary science. And, you know, that's going to cause ripples in that area. Because if you look at the 70s, you did have a great time of planetary exploration, and then it sort of fizzled out. In the 80s, you know, to my knowledge, there were no, and I could be wrong, but I don't remember there being any Mars landers in the 80s. I don't remember there being something big like Viking during that decade, you know, where 
you had a, a giant program where you had an orbiter and you had, you know, landers and things like that. So really, if you look at it, it, it reminds me of, wow, we're in the 70s all over, all over again. I'll just be blunt. It sucks. I, I would like to see a Mars sample return mission, but obviously that's contingent on money. So <laughs> perhaps we need to do a whole episode on 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 the finances of NASA. I don't know if that's going yeah. to be interesting at all, but but the budget of NASA, yeah, perhaps really delve into what where what money gets spent on and and and, and why we have these these issues because. I don't know. I mean, the things that are really... I, I am very excited about the idea of going back to the moon. I think it's going to be amazing. Obviously, sending humans to the moon is going to be, in our lifetime, while I'm alive, having yeah. people walking on the moon will be so exciting. But we know that the private private enterprise is going down that route anyway. Yeah. Again, it brings up that whole argument of what does NASA need to be funding? Does it need to be funding Artemis? I would love it to be Artemis. I'd love it to be NASA. But if, yeah. if resources are finite, which they are, and we're losing planetary science, which I don't think there is as much interest from private industry to be funded, then should taxpayer money not go towards those kind of things? I, I mean, I'm saying that as someone who doesn't pay US taxes, obviously, as well. But uh, yeah. It, a government funding project should be doing the things that are perhaps stepping in where private industry doesn't want to do. We know that Elon wants to send Starship to the moon anyway. Yeah. And yes, NASA has helped fund that, but we know that's his plan anyway, and he would have tried to find a way even without NASA, and that may have been harder, but he want, would have done that. We, we know that Jeff Bezos is building a, a rocket that, that will hopefully be able to take people further than than. Uh, for a bit as well. It looks like private entries is going that down route. Would I like to see NASA do it? Of course. And I'm not saying I want to see Artemis scrapped. I don't. But when you have to start having this conversation about opportunity cost of Artemis versus science exploration, I think that gets a hard that becomes a harder conversation. And it's not just the Mars lander that that might go off go up here. There's talks of the the missions we were getting excited about going about going to Uranus they look like they might be going as well, potentially. And we were so excited about the idea of a spacecraft returning to Uranus after for the first time since Voyager. Yeah. And now that might not happen either. And no one else is queuing up to do it. You know, no one else is is, is putting money together. And, and, and we know that if NASA do it, and they can do it in collaboration with ESA, then that makes it easier for the two of them. They've done lots of joint or, or other, like JAXA, all these other governmental space yeah. programs. That, you know, even in collaboration, they can do these things together. But NASA does is the world leader, and it will require, this, a lot of these projects require NASA. I mean, Mars Sample Return is, is, a, is a collaboration project. It's not just yeah. NASA doing it. But if NASA, if the funding from NASA comes away, it won't happen. And and that's that's the danger of this stuff. Anyway, probably talked about that for far too long now. But um, I, it potentially is a whole episode, uh, and I don't know who we'd ask to, yeah. to come and talk to us more about budgets of NASA. But um, yeah, I, 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 somebody who's a space policy, a space policy person, <laughs> policy someone. Yeah, I mean, why not? I think um, certainly these conversations need to be had. And uh, while yeah. we're while it's I great agree. that the public are excited about going back to the moon, apparently enough to to fund Artemis. I think that NASA's real benefit is in the stuff that isn't perhaps the headline stuff. It is Landsat. It is uh, yeah, oh yeah, planetary science. That stuff that no one else would even think of perhaps of funding. Anyway, I agree totally, and I I would also like to have maybe somebody on our show who's like a space budgetary expert to explain yeah. all these things because I'll be honest, I don't fully understand a lot of it, um, and I, I would like a a better picture of where this money goes, which programs it's going to, you know, why are certain things a priority versus other things? And why do things go so over budget? Exactly. Is, is there a reason why almost every project tends to go over budget? Not by a little bit, by billions. Because the Mars sample return thing, I mean, it went over not by a little amount. Like, we're not talking, you know, 10 o Ten dollars over, you know, yeah, or something exactly. like that. It's like the difference if you go to the grocery store of being like a few cents over to like a few hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was uh, yeah, I spent seven hundred dollars just buying groceries. Like, I think it's important not only if you're a United States 
citizen, but I think it's important to know where that money is going to. I think people have a right to know where this goes to and what the future of exploration, you know, how it's contingent on these things. So I know I agree. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, they're the things that have caught my eye this week. You're listening to the Space and Things podcast. Okay, that's it for this week. Thanks for joining us. I was, I'm never sure whether to say once again, because I don't know if you're listening for the first time or if this is your <laughs> 152nd episode you listen to. But thanks for this. Thank you for joining us. Anyway, we've been planning our episodes through August and into September this week. So to be the first to find out what we've got coming up, you can do so by signing up to our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash space and things. I know we mentioned that a lot this week, but it really is going to be uh, the make or break thing for this podcast at the moment. So please yes. head over there if if if, uh, if you're slightly inclined to see us carry on. Anyway, uh, also, it's a great opportunity for you to submit questions for our upcoming guests as well. Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much for listening. Um, We'll be back next week with more Space and Things, but don't forget, in space, no one can hear you meet. Thanks for listening to the Space and Things podcast. Back next Thursday with a brand new episode.